to your seats. The presence of the Lord is in this room, and He's not done in this place. I just want to give honor to my pastor, your pastor, our pastor. Thankful for him, for his ministry, for his leadership of this flock. It's an awesome opportunity that our pastor gets to go and minister at other churches, and they get to experience how awesome he is. So we're thankful for that, and uh, thankful for for him and his wife. They're pretty. They're pretty cool, most of the time. Unless they're giving me a hard time. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, I got to put the, the the church member hat back on. No, they're they're awesome. I'm thankful for them. Thankful for their ministry. Pray for them as they're not with us right now, but they're ministering in England. Pray for safe return. It's always a privilege and an honor to be here with you all in this capacity. I don't take it lightly. I'm thankful for the opportunity to minister the word and especially to minister it at home. Um, I do believe I have a word for someone in this place, if not one person, hopefully more than one. But if not, I know that this is for at least someone here this evening. Uh, I'm going to start. We're going to open up our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 7. I apologize in advance to some young people. They'll hear some things that may sound a little familiar. I spoke about this a few weeks ago, but as soon as I heard or found out I was speaking this evening, it was coming back into my spirit, and I just felt I needed to talk about it with the congregation. So here we are. I would have loved for it to be, you know, something fresh and new no one's ever heard before, but I'm not in control, so I just I just do what he tells me. But if you don't mind, would you stand? Exodus chapter 7, in honor of the reading of the word. Exodus chapter 7, starting with verse 10. It says, And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments. Everyone say enchantments. And if we could fast forward a few chapters to Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse 10. This is now after the plagues have been unleashed. Pharaoh's done. He's now given Moses the go-ahead to take the people out of Israel. But now they are stuck between a rock and a hard place, if you will. They got Pharaoh behind them and water in front of them. And they are worried and afraid for their lives. And it says, and when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up. Sorry, this is verse 10 of chapter 14. And the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen? Moses, let us alone, leave us alone. Didn't we say to let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. It would be better for us to live as slaves than die a free nation. We'd rather keep living in our bondage than die in freedom. For a few moments here this evening, I want to talk to you, preach to you, on the subject, the enchantments of Egypt. The enchantments of Egypt. If all across this place we could close our Bibles, lift up our hands. The Lord has already been in this room. He's already begun to do a work. But right now, can we just make sure the grounds of our heart is, is ready to receive and hear what it is he has for us this evening. In the name of Jesus. Come on, with your own voice right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Father, let this word find good ground in our hearts and our spirits that we would receive it with an open heart, God, with an open mind, that we could have a place in your kingdom and that you could have your way in our lives, Father. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you can be seated in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. 
There is nothing greater than the call of God on a person's life. I, uh, I'm privileged to be involved in ministry as are many of you, if not all of you, given the fact we are all ministers, those that are born again. To some capacity, you are a minister for God. But it is, it is not something that I take lightly, whether it's preaching up here, whether it's leading the youth, whether it's teaching a Bible study. Wherever I am ministering, whenever I am answering the call of God on my life, I'm reminded of the importance of this. There is nothing greater. There is nothing that matters to me more. The second greatest decision I ever made in my life, the second, was marrying my wife. But the first was answering the call of God, being born again into his kingdom. There's nothing greater than the call of God on a person's life. There's nothing greater than being consecrated to that call, to being a part of his kingdom, to being a part of his bride, to being a part of his body. That does not mean that there will not be challenges, there will not be things to face. My own life is an example of that. While I had the, felt the call of God for many years, there was many times I would run from it. I would go and focus and try to turn my you know, head towards God and the things of his kingdom, but then I'd be distracted with the cares of this life. And there were many cares and concerns and, and situations in my life that would come up. They would try to hinder and try to distract. If I could say it this way, they were attempts from the enemy. Because one thing I can tell you, when you decide to answer the call of God in your life, when you decide to be a part of his kingdom, your life's not going to get easier. Because it's in that moment that you're deciding, I'm going against the opposition. I'm going against the adversary. And he's not going to sit idly by while you decide to impact his kingdom. So it's in those moments that the devil's going to turn, turn the dial up a little bit and say, okay, I can't let Jalen out of my sights. I, I can't leave Julian alone because if I do, he's going to start doing things for the kingdom of God. He's going to start doing things contrary to my plans. And so as we come against situations in life, we are reminded of the importance of the call. Israel faces this very situation in their own life as they are now a part of uh, Egypt, living in Egypt, dwelling in Egypt, there was a famine, and they found themselves living there. And after a while, the Pharaoh, after it says that, uh, I'll read it, it says, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph was the, 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 the contact point, if you will, for the nation of Israel. He was an Israelite, and he had become the second most powerful excuse me, person in Egypt. And so he now is not around anymore. He's passed on. And there arose a Pharaoh, a new king that did not know Joseph. And he said unto his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it came to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them out of the land. Because of the call of Israel, because of the, the special blessing that was on this nation pharaoh started to realize i've got to do something about these people these people are not my people these people are not my nation and if they decide to rise up against me i might not be able to stop them if i could tell it to you this way given that israel is a reflection of the body of christ in the new covenant and egypt is often too oftentimes referred to as the world this is a reflection of the adversaries taking acknowledgement of what the nation, the people of Israel or the nation of God, the people of God would be in opposition to him. The enemy cannot sit idly by and watch as God's people are blessed and as God's people multiply because he knows if I let them be, they're going to realize who they are. They're going to realize the power that they have. They're going to realize the dominion that they have. They're going to realize that they are mightier than me, that they are greater than me, that they are stronger than me. And if I let them alone, if I leave them be, they could overtake us. And so Pharaoh, in fear of Israel overthrowing him and his kingdom, he decides to put opposition in their life. And he puts them into slavery. He puts, puts resistance on them, puts struggle and puts puts taskmasters over them and trying to hinder their growth. But the Bible tells us in Exodus 1 verse 12, but that the more that he afflicted them, the more that the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites, the more they multiplied and grew. Can I tell you today that God does some of his best work in resistance? Yes, it'd be nice and easy if we never had to go through anything and we could just answer the call and stay consecrated to the call and everything be just sunshine and rainbows. 
But can I tell you that when you start to meet resistance and when the enemy decides, I'm not going to let you alone, Joshua, I've got to do something to oppose you. God says, it's all right, because in that opposition, I can still grow you. I can still multiply you. I can still cultivate you in an environment that is conducive for your spiritual growth. You can become who I've called you to be in that resistance. You can become who I've called you to be in that problem and in that trial and that situation. When you answer the call, it's not going to be easier. You're going to meet resistance, but by the grace of God, you will overcome. And in that affliction, in that resistance, you can become greater and stronger in the kingdom of God. But Pharaoh doesn't stop here, neither does the adversary. He's not going to give up after his first attempt of trying to slow you down. Pharaoh realizes, okay, I am afflicting them. I am causing resistance to come against them, but yet they are still growing. growing. And so Pharaoh decides to up the ante. He says, you know what? This isn't good enough, so we're going we're gonna to change this up a bit. It says in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, that Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast, every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Pharaoh decides that it's not good enough for me to just put opposition in the way, but now I'm going to actually take their life. I'm going to take their children. I'm going to take their legacy. I'm going to go even more intense. And I find it interesting. God is, I guess he's got a sense of humor or he's just very creative in the way he expresses things and handles things. God could have preserved Moses, the one that would be used to leave, to lead Israel in, out of bondage into freedom. He could have preserved Moses any way he wanted, but he chose one particular way. What way was that? The river, the water. He said, uh, Moses, Moses' mother makes him a basket puts him in this basket. It's an ark. It's used to navigate him down the river and preserve him. I find it interesting because you know how Pharaoh told his people to get rid of the boys. Put him in the river. So Pharaoh's like, I'm going to use this method to destroy my enemy. I'm going to use this method to destroy the threat. But God said, guess what? That's fine. You can do what you want. I'm going to use it to preserve my plan. I'm going to use it to make a way for God to do something, for me to do something even greater through Israel. I'm going to, the very thing that the enemy wants to use to destroy the nation of Israel, God is going to use to preserve it. God is amazing in his, in his ability, in his, in his detail, in the way he maneuvers and handles and situates things. I'm here to tell you today, when it comes to answering the call, when it comes to being a child of God, when it comes to being who he's called you to be, it's not going to be a matter of if God can preserve me or not. It's not going to be a matter of if God is able to keep me, if God is able to to direct me, if God has the power or the ability or the authority. That's not the problem. There's another situation that that comes into play when when when, when determining whether or not I can make it in this this plan, of li- this plan of God this, that, that he has for my life, the, the plan, the, the calling, the being a child of him, being a part of his kingdom. I keep saying the call of God. I don't want you to tune me out and think I'm talking to preachers and I'm talking to those in the fivefold ministry. If you have the Holy Ghost, you are called of God. If you are born again, believer, you are called of God. If you're here in this place and you haven't been born again, you are called of God. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every person's life. It's not a matter of if I'm called. It's a matter of if I'm going to answer the call. It's not a matter of not if I'm chosen. It's a matter of if I am going to consecrate myself to what he has chosen me to do and who he has chosen me to be. He's got a plan. And the matter of it all is not about what he is, is or is not able to do. But there's something else that we have to overcome, much like Israel had to in their bondage and in their time in Egypt. There were challenges that they would have to face and things that they would have to overcome before they could be freed. And that's where I want to focus most of my time here this evening on, and that is the enchantments of Egypt. I apologize. My voice is going. Long week of cold something, and apparently it's still lingering. Exodus chapter 7, verse 11. I already read it, but permit me to read it again. It says, Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. I find it interesting that in this moment, God tells Moses and tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, if you read through the story, Essentially, God is going to unleash his power in this season in Egypt. He tells Moses, I am going to do some stuff. 
I'm going to do some things that no one's seen before. Moses, I'm going to do some things you haven't seen. You saw me have a burning bush that wasn't actually, like, you know, eva- not evaporating. What's the word? Just consumed. Thank you. <laughs> evaporating. Yeah, it's a vapor. No. That wasn't consumed. You, you saw me turn a snake into a, a staff into a snake and a snake into a staff. You saw me give you leprosy and take me. You've seen some cool stuff. But I'm telling you, Moses, you haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to do some pretty awesome stuff. And that's how he, he tells Moses and tells Pharaoh, I'm going to do, do some powerful stuff in Egypt. So I find it interesting that Pharaoh and his people have the audacity to conjure up what seems to be the same miracle. God says, Moses, this is how I'm going to set us free. I'm going to do some powerful stuff. I'm going to unleash some miracles, and it's going to be awesome. And I can see in this moment, Moses brings Aaron, and they've got the rod, and they're going. He's like, all right, Aaron, this is it. It's going down. God's about to do some stuff. He's about to turn this staff into a snake. Pharaoh's going to lose his mind. And we're getting out of here. I figured he probably thought it was going to be a quick, quick, uh, quick, quick example, and then we're going to be on the road. And he goes before Pharaoh, and he's like, "Hey, gotta let God's people go." Pharaoh's like, "Who are you? And who is your God?" And he's like, "All right, that's it. Aaron, drop the rod." It's like the Old Testament version of drop the mic. He says, "Drop the rod." He drops the rod. It turns into a snake, and Pharaoh does absolutely nothing. He literally looks at it and says, "Magicians, come! Not musicians. Sorry." Not musicians. Magicians, come. Magicians, come come deal with this guy. He's, he turned a staff into a snake, and I'm supposed to be impressed. And his magicians come. His people come. And he had multiple. He didn't just have one. And now they go and do the same thing that Moses just did or Aaron just did or God just did through them with this rod. They go and do the same thing. And guess what? It doesn't end there. It continues on through the, the first couple of plagues. This continues to happen. It says in Exodus 7, verse 20, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died. And the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink of water of the river. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt, once again, did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. So it continues on. You can go to the next chapter, Exodus 8, verse 5. Again, the Lord speaks to Moses and says to Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with the rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt. And the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So not only this first encounter with Moses and Pharaoh where God starts to show his power, do these magicians come and their enchantments and they do something that looks exactly like the power of God. But now in the first two plagues that are happening, still, what happens? These, these magicians, these these, these, these wise men, these crafty people come up again with their enchantments and now again are doing what seems to be the same thing that God is doing. They are performing miracles. They are releasing, releasing powerful things to happen. But what if I told you that I am not of the opinion that they had the power of God? That they had, some, some, I've heard some, I've read a bunch of different things on it. Some people believe they were using power of the devil. I don't even think that was happening. You know what I believe happened? Let's look, at the, let's look at the Hebrew of that word enchantment. It doesn't mean, you know, mystical sorcery and powerful magic or creating nothing out of, or something out of nothing. It literally means secrecy, mystery, covertly, secretly. It's the same word used to describe Saul when he was secretly trying to get David to come back into his home so that he could take his life. It's the same word used to describe David when he was covertly going about trying to cut Saul. It's, to des- it's describing a secret thing, a hidden thing, kind of like, watch this hand while I move something over here. So here's, the, here's one of the enchantments of Egypt that we've got to be aware of. We've got to watch out. We've got to watch out for. Egypt knows how to imitate God. Egypt knows how to make it appear that they can give you the same thing that God can give you. God can make a snake out of a stick. I can make a stick. God can make blood from water. I can make blood from water. Think about it. First of all, Egypt, I know we're getting into the, 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 more to the teaching side of a moment, but bear with me. Egypt, think about it. 
It's still common today. A practice they have is called snake charming. I don't think it was hard for them to turn a snake into a stick. It probably was, and they just dropped it and it started moving. Think about it. I'm obviously, you know, taking some liberty, but I just think about how easy these tricks are. I've seen some crazy, like, street magicians do some wild stuff. Do I believe it's magic? No, I believe it's a, 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 a trick. Like, look over here while I move something over here. Or here's the interesting, if you don't believe me, look at the, look at the miracle of the blood. If you read more in that chapter about God, when he tells, he tells Moses what he's going to do, he says, all of the water in Egypt, I'm turning to blood. He said, from the ponds, to the rivers, to the pools, to the water that's in the wooden vessels, to the water that's in the, the stone vessels. So here's my question. If God turned all the water into blood, where did their water come from? They probably, the, the word described, it says also that they are wise men. It's not wise in the word that we use it today, like something to be honored. It's wise it's the same way they describe the serpent, subtle, sneaky, crafty. So they probably realized, wait a minute, all the water's turned to blood. You grab that pot real quick. And let me just dump it out. And you're ready. Oh, here we go. Oh, look, we did it too. Because Egypt knows how to take credit for what God can do. Egypt knows how to imitate God for a moment. Because guess what happens? The first few plagues, they were keeping up with them. But guess what? After the frogs, the Pharaoh calls his Egyptian, his magician, and says, "Hey, make this happen. Do this with." He just turned. He just turned lice. He just created lice from dust. Do that. And it says they tried, but they couldn't do it anymore. And they said, "There's something about this God that Moses is talking about. We can't do what He can do." So can I tell you, if you stick around God long enough, you're going to realize the world's got some cheap imitations to offer you with what God can do. They'll tell you, I can give you love. You, can, you don't need God to find love. Yes, you do, because God is love. And the Bible tells us that if you don't know God, then you don't know love. If you don't have love in your heart, you don't know, because it's one and the same. But the world says, no, oh, this is it. <laughs> oh, about to get off track. <clears throat> I, I, mm, uh, <laughs> the Lord loves to take credit for what God does. Loves to warp what he has planned for us. And I, I keep referring to the world. If you don't know by now, when I'm talking about Egypt, I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about the things that we live in, the environments that we are surrounded with, the things of sin and shame that we have to battle every single day. And the world loves to take credit for what God can do. The world says love is love. I'll leave that for interpretation. That's as they do. That's, that's what love, love is love. You just love what you want, love how you want, love who you want. No one can tell you anything about it. Well... This tells me that God is love. This tells me that this word is a part of who he is. So if love is love contradicts what's in this, then it's not okay. And it's not love. Because God is love. Love is God. To know God is to know love. So I can't just say love is what I decided it is today. The world wants to take credit for what God created. The world wants to take credit for what God can do. Or how about this? You don't, you don't, need, you don't need God to have, to have peace. You don't need God to have hope. You don't need God to have joy. You can, you can find joy in this world. You can find joy in entertainment. You can find joy in finances and success. You can find, yeah, for a moment. It doesn't last because, like I said, it is a cheap imitation of the joy of God. It is a cheap imitation of the love of God. It is a cheap imitation of the peace, of the grace, of the hope, of the mercy of God. This world can only imitate what they've seen God do, but they cannot give you what God truly has. They cannot take place for what God truly is. Egypt knows how to imitate, how to mimic God, but for a moment. Egypt, Egypt knows how to convince you that bondage equals freedom. I have a question. If Israel, Pharaoh is, is afraid, becomes afraid of Israel, starts to oppress them, puts them into slavery, because he's afraid of how mighty and great they are, and that they uh, could one day decide to go against Egypt and overthrow them and things of that nature. So I have a question. If Israel was already becoming so great and mighty, why didn't they fight back when persecuted by Pharaoh? Why didn't they fight back when, when thrown into slavery and bondage? I, I'm sorry, but if someone's telling me, yeah, you're, you're going to go into slavery, I feel like I'd be like, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, no, no, thank you. I'm good. You can keep that. Why didn't they fight back? There's nothing said in Scripture where it says, and they rose up and they come again. They tried to, they tried to conquer Egypt, but Egypt over, overtook them and they won. It just says they put them in bondage. You want to know why? Because Egypt knows how to convince you that bondage equals freedom. 
If you read about it in Genesis chapter 47, it's a lot of verses. I'm not going to read it, but it, trust me, it's in there. Genesis 47, you can go back and read it if you doubt me. It talks about the famine. This is back when Joseph was around, and it's talking about the famine and what's going on. Do you know Israel is not the first nation that Egypt put into slavery? Do you know who the first nation Egypt put into slavery is? Egypt. If you read that chapter, it talks about how they were experiencing the famine as well, but Egypt was the only land that prepared for it, so they had food and grain and so forth. And so they are in uh, Egypt, and the Egyptians are also experiencing this famine. So they had to go to Joseph and the Pharaoh and to the leaders to get food. And it says that they would give them their money for food. But then it tells them that they ran out of money. And so when they ran out of money, they said, oh, well, I've got some animals. I've got some, I've got some, some possessions, some cattle. I can give you that. I can sell you that. And then you can give me food. But then they ran out of food. You know what they did after they didn't have or ran out of uh, possessions? You know what they did after they didn't have any more possessions and cattle and money? They sold their land and they sold themselves. And the same word used, they said, we'll be your servants. That same word is the word described as slavery that is applied to Israel throughout the entire book of Exodus. So Egypt was able to convince Israel that it's okay, you can be in bondage, you can be in, you can be in this, you can experience all this oppression because we do it to ourselves. If that is not a reflection of the world, I don't know what is because the world wants to offer all these things and all I see is bondage, bondage, bondage. You can have freedom and drink whatever you want. Bondage. You can have freedom and smoke whatever you want. Bondage. You can have freedom and have any kind of relationship you want. Bondage. Any of those things, it's fun for a moment, but then you start to realize, how did I get? Do you think any addict decided I'm going to end up an addict? I want to go there. That's who I want to become. No. They started but for a moment and said, oh, well, you know what? It's fine. You're doing it, so I'll do it too. And then eventually they get to a point where they don't even know who they are. And they are bound by their sin. They are bound by their situations. They are bound by their circumstances. Because the world around them was able to convince them it's not really bondage. It's freedom. It's okay to enjoy that. It's fun for a moment. Yeah, but then there's going to come a point in time when you're going to look back and say, how did I get here? I can't move. My, I can't go a day without this anymore. I can't go a day without. Yeah, because you are now bound. Because the world can convince you that what is freedom is bondage. Well, you get the right to choose whatever you want and do whatever you want. It's freedom for a moment. But it's their way to get you into bondage. Israel knows how to convince you that bondage is freedom. And those things are great. Those things are important. Those things are, are necessary. I know it might even seem like this is an evangelistic message where I'm talking to, 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 to people that aren't in the church. But again, reminding you, this is stuff from the Bible talking about Israel, which is a reflection of the body. So I'm not talking to guests here tonight. If you're a guest, this applies to you, sure, but I am speaking to the body. I don't want you to tune me out because you're like, oh, he's talking, he's talking to new converts, and he's talking, no, I'm talking to everyone. Because this is, this is where Israel was. This is what Israel, Israel could not become who they were called to be because they found themselves bound in Egypt. They found themselves being enchanted by what Egypt could cultivate, by what Egypt could do. They literally said it as much. How many times when they were finally set free did they go to Moses and complain, oh, but we had leeks and garlic and all this nice stuff. Yeah, while you were in chains. Oh, but we had nice drinks and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, while you were getting your back beaten. They were still convinced that what they had back there was freedom and was luxury and was, was, was vacation home. But it wasn't freedom. But even beyond all that, what I believe was Israel's greatest struggle and the biggest enchantment of Egypt that they had to overcome, the biggest battle that they were going to have to conquer, <clears throat> was this. Egypt knows how to get you to settle. Egypt knows how to get you to settle. Israel didn't cry out to God for 430 years. Because the Bible says, God told Abraham, I'm going to put your people in a land that's not theirs. They're going to be uh, afflicted while they're there. And they're going to be there for, does anyone know how many years he said? 400. He told them, I'm gonna, I'm, they're going to be afflicted by these Egyptians for 400 years. But it's interesting because if you read Exodus 12, verse 40, it says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 
years. This is the verse that's right at the moment when, e- when Israel's finally leaving Egypt. So did God get his numbers wrong? Is the Bible not the Bible and there's a contradiction or a flaw? Or is there something else to explain why God said 400 years they're going to be afflicted by Egypt, but they didn't get out of Egypt for 430 years? Now, I've heard some people, they want to blame it on Moses. If you do the math, Moses, I think it would have been about 10 years after he fled Egypt because he murdered an Egyptian, would have been around the 400-year mark, give or take. I don't personally believe it's Moses because if, if that's the reason, then that means God withheld freedom from all of these thousands upon thousands of people because one person wasn't making up his mind to do whatever or, or had to get over his own whatever. But even then, God could have used anybody. So I'm not personally of the opinion that it was Moses' fault that they took so long. For the main reason being this, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 It says, and it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. That very next verse is the first verse in the next chapter when it talks about Moses and his encounter with the burning bush. So you go from God finally hearing the Israelites cry and say, God, we want out of here. And the very next moment, God's like, all right, Moses, it's time for you to go set my people free. Because I've, I've heard their cries. I've heard their prayer. So why, why, why did it take them that long to cry out? Why did it take them such an extra, extra period of time? Because here's what's amazing. It says that, and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. There's also verses in the Bible that talk about how God rose up Pharaoh to do it. Like God put Pharaoh in the position he put him in in Egypt to get Israel where they needed to be. Do you know which Pharaoh he's talking about? Not the one that died. The one that's after the one that died. And it's after that one that died that Israel finally starts crying out and says, God, get us out of here. So I... God literally rose up the last Pharaoh to say, okay, that's it. Y'all have gotten a little too comfortable with where you're at. I didn't call y'all to serve in Egypt. I didn't call y'all to be bound in Egypt. I called y'all to be my chosen nation, my peculiar people, my people that are set apart. I've called you out of darkness and into my light. I've called you to be who, who, who my people are, who my, my people in the wilderness, my people in your own land. That's who I've called you to be. But you have become so comfortable with your life here in Egypt. This is probably the biggest struggle I believe many people have when it comes to answering the call of God. Is we get comfortable in our situations. We get comfortable with where we're at and we realize, you know, I mean, they cried about it so many times. Israel kept saying over and over, yeah, we had it so nice in Egypt. Yeah, we were slaves, but we had nice food and we got to relax. But you weren't free. You weren't who you weren't walking in the calling of God that you had. You were settling for less than who he called you to be. Yeah, but we had it nice. We didn't have to work as hard, or we did have to work hard, but we didn't have to walk as long, and we didn't have to sit out in this sun as much because we had, like, you know, the big buildings around us to kind of keep us shaded, and they try to, they just, (laughs) Israel gets comfortable with where they're at when God tries to tell them, I've got more for you. I've got something greater in store for you. I've got bigger plans for you that go beyond just you serving in Egypt and living in Egypt, but they got comfortable with where they were. We've got to be careful. I I personally believe there are many people, because again, this is an affliction. And the Bible tells us that God said, Egypt will afflict you for 400 years. And that means they stayed in it for another 30 after God's appointed time for them to no longer be afflicted by Egypt. So that tells me that Israel willingly was allowing themselves to be afflicted. How many of us today in our lives willingly allow ourselves to be afflicted by things of this life? How many of us, whether it's situations, there's something that maybe there was a problem that happened in our life and God meant it for a moment, but we've gotten so used to it, so comfortable, that it was like, I'm just going to live with it at this point. I don't need God. It's, I'm not going to pray about it anymore. I'm just going to stay here. 
How many things in our lives, how many, how many problems do we have, how many problems in our relationships do we have, and we just let them be and we leave them the same way because, well, it's been this way for so long, and I don't remember what it was like before that, so I'm just going to remain here. I'm going to just stay afflicted. When God says, no, I've called you out of that, I'm not causing you to live here anymore. I've got a plan that goes beyond this. I've got a purpose that goes beyond this, but you have to decide, I don't want to stay here any longer. How many things in this world, and again, this is the work of, an e of, of Egypt. This is the work of the world. How many things in this world do they decide to convince you you have to live with it? That the word of God, if you took the time to read it, would tell you he is greater than all of it. I've got ADD, so I'm just going to be. You want to claim it on that? Go for it. Because guess what? Here's, here's, the, here's the crazy thing. I'm sorry. And I, trust me, I know there are serious issues and all this stuff going on in the world. This is not me to make light of it. This is me just telling you what I found in the word of God. Here's what's interesting to me. The world doesn't want to cure you from anything. They want you to tame it. They want to give you the medication to tame your struggle focusing. They want to give you the, the psychiatrist and the person to, to go and talk to about all your problems to, to help tame your anxiety. I believe that that kind of stuff is right in the, in the proper moment, in the proper season, in the proper circumstances. But my point is this. The world does not try to cure you of any of it. They want to simply tame. They want to help you to control it. They don't want you to be rid of the bondage. They want you to just subject yourself to it and say, as long as you learn how to move with it and work with it, it's going to happen. But can I tell you that the Bible tells me that God is greater than all of that? The Bible tells me that I can go for him for comfort if I've got anxiety. The Bible tells me that I can go to him as my healer, as my provider. There's nothing in this world that he is not greater than. So why do we submit ourselves and subject ourselves and say, well, I'm just going to live with this because I. There are so many things in this world. Again, I'm not trying to make light of situations. I'm just trying to help you realize. We will go to the world for so many things because it's normal. It's comfortable. It's what we're accustomed to. And it's what the world around us does. When God says, I've called you out of that, Israel's problem was not the oppression of Egypt. It wasn't that Egypt was more powerful than them. It was that Israel said, Egypt does it this way, so we're going to do it this way. They live this way, so I'm going to live this way. They, stay, they have these bondage, these bondage and these chains and these shackles in them, so I'm going to have this bondage. When God says, I did not call you to live that way. I did not call you to do that thing. I did not call you to be that person. I've called you to go beyond. I've called you to be separated. I've called you to live differently. I've called you to live holy but we get so so focused on what the world looks like around us and what the people around us are doing here's what's amazing to me at the end of it all in exodus 14 they've now left their uh they're, they've left egypt and they're out and they're they're in between the the sea and Pharaoh's army. And there, Israel's freaking out. They're worried of losing their life. They don't want to die, all this other stuff. And it says in verse 15 in chapter 14 of Exodus, The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get my honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten my honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know. Go back to that verse. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Once I do this great thing. The Egyptians shall know. You want to know why this matters? Why we can't respond the same way the world responds? Why we can't, as, as children of God, decide to live how they want to live and do what they want to do and react how they want to react and subject ourselves to what they want to subject our, themselves to? Do you know why? Because they will not know who he is if we respond to everything the same way they do. While they were in Egypt and God was doing all these amazing things, 
They obviously still didn't know who God was because he has to say, and the Egyptians will know once I've showed them outside of this. This moment is after Egypt. This moment is outside of Egypt. This moment is when Israel is no longer in chains, and no longer bound. When Israel is finally walking in the will of God, finally walking in the power of God, finally walking with the authority of God and the call of God in their life. When Israel finally walks the way they are supposed to walk and talks the way they are supposed to talk and responds to the situation the way they are supposed to respond to it then finally the world that they were surrounded by could now see that he was God they will not know if we are so focused doing it the same way that they do it responding the same way that they respond and reacting the same way they react they will know when you walk differently when you talk differently when you respond differently when you don't get out of your bondage and your addiction the same way that everyone else does when you got Can you lift your hands for a moment and just pray? In the name of Jesus. Ramande <laughs> Sheta ramandai, ita remando lo mondo sikaya, shi ramandai alamande sabaya, yeka shema romondo lo bo sekia talamandaye, yati ama yeba yesha, shama seko to mondo bo sata, shitama sata mahaye, ika to mondo sata basha, shi ramandi alamanda saye. Yeta yema rema sema kotomo sata yelemendi alalamando bosaye iramande alalama sata yalalamaye yela ramande alalama saye yele alalamando lolo bosata ye iremende saya yela mamande alalama sato lobo shaye. Egypt had convinced Israel that they were good enough living the same way that the Egyptians lived, doing the same thing that the Egyptians did. They were convinced because they had some form of what looked to be power. You can find what you want, but you, you don't need to do all the things that you were supposed to do as Israelites to, to find joy, to find you know, happiness, to find love. You can find it with us. We can, we can give you the same thing God can give you. They, Egypt convinced them that they, they, they didn't need to... Uh, you know, be free in the desert because they could live in bondage because that was the normal way to live. That's the normal thing to accept. It's, it's you want to do that. You want to, you want to live how we live. You want to do what we do. Egypt convinced Israel to settle for less than great. God called them to be great. He said it many times that they were a great nation. They would be made a great nation. In fact, God even said, I'm going to make you a great nation through what you go through in Egypt. But Egypt convinced Israel to settle for less than great. You can still, I'm I'm not here to tell everyone that if you decide to live in Egypt, if you decide to live in the world, whatever that means to you, that you can't make it to heaven. Depending, I'm not talking about, if I'm not talking about sin things, and I'm talking talking about sin, then yeah, you're not going to make it. (laughs) We're talking about things that aren't sin, but just lifestyle or 
whatever, and you've got book, chapter, and verse to support what you do or however you feel or whatever, that's, that's between you and God. But I'm here to tell you, if you want to be who he's called you to be, and you want to have the, 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 the call that he has placed on your life, if you want to, what, again, I'm not talking about a pulpit. I'm not talking about being a teacher or a preacher or a, a pastor. I'm talking about simply answering the call that he has placed for you to do. Reach the world around you. Be an influence where you are. Be the person that he's called you to be, to whatever capacity that it is. If you want to fi- be the best possible version, if you don't want to settle, if you don't want to just be satisfied with just, I'm just going to make it to church on Sunday and then just do what I want through the week and I'm just going to come back and rinse and repeat. If you don't want that, it requires you to get out of the enchantments of Egypt. It requires you to make up in your mind that I'm not going to go to the world for my joy. I'm going to go to the word. I'm not going to go to the world's definition of love. You know what's funny about the world's definition of stuff? It changes all the time. All the time. What was their answer for something 50 years ago is not the answer of it today. I told told the youth this morning. It blows my mind, the stuff that, I mean, think about it. 200 years ago, slavery was normal in America. It's not today. Now, thank God it's not the normal thing today. My point is, 200 years ago, that was the normal thing to do. You weren't crazy if you were doing that. You are one of the leaders of the country. Or yeah, I'll go, on, I'll go more, um, a more conservative approach. Let's talk about smoking tobacco. I remember seeing the advertisements as a kid and seeing the old ones from like an old, like something my grandfather would record on like a VHS tape and watching it and watching them. And they would talk about smoking tobacco. And I was like, hey, your doctor recommends it. What are they doing today? Don't do it. It's going to kill you. It's giving you cancer. Why? Because the world changes. Or oh, this one's this one, I thought of this one after the youth class. This one cracked me up. This baffled me during 2020. I'm not getting into politics, I'm just using it as an example. And I will remain partial throughout this example because both sides flipped, which I thought was funny. Pre-2020, left side is all about my body, my choice. Right side is all about you've got to think about you know, someone else. You've got to think about someone else's life. You can't, it's not your body, your choice. There's someone else's life involved. So you've got to think about that. Right? COVID comes. What happened? Left side. Where's your mask? You got to keep it on. You got to think about my health. You can't not have your mask on. It's not your body, your choice. You're affecting me. Right side. It's my body, my choice. If I don't want a mask, I won't wear a mask. Did y'all notice that? Think about it. Literally switched. Before 2020, they fell one way. After 2020, you're literally contradicting yourself. That's what the world does. It changes. Which is why you can't go to the world for what's right or what's wrong you can't go to the world for what sets your your truth what sets your normal so you've got to go to the word you've got to allow the word that is timeless the word that is endless the word that is a part of God and God will never change the same yesterday today and forever you've got to go to that to define who you are what you're going to do where you're going to go who you're going to be so the world will change you've got to go to the word But Egypt convinced Israel that they could settle where they were at and they would be fine. Jonathan, you can come. I'm almost pretty much done. That they would be fine with where they were and how things were were going. Thankfully, God had other plans. And I'm here to tell you today, I hope he doesn't have to raise up a pharaoh in your life, so to speak. Because if you think about it, Israel, God had to do that as an absolute last response because, again, 400 years is what God said, Egypt will afflict you. But they were there for 430, and God finally said, all right, I got to take this Pharaoh out. They're too comfortable with him. I'm going to put this Pharaoh in there, and he's going to wake, up, wake them up and realize, you know what, I don't want to stay here anymore. He had to raise opposition up in their life to finally get them to realize this is not where I'm supposed to stop. This was for a season. This was for a moment. There's something beyond this. There's something greater than this, but I can't stay here. But God had to raise up someone in their life to create so much opposition that they finally, to stir them up, that they finally realize, you know what, God, I don't want to stop here anymore. I don't want to stay here. So I pray. Why? It's like my mom would always 
the hope that I would learn it the easy way, not the hard way. I was stubborn and always learned it the hard way. I'm talking to the body of Christ today. Don't, don't learn it the hard way. Don't wait until God has to come and raise up some sort of situation in your life. That he finally says, look, I'm trying to get a hold of you. So because you're not listening, I'm going to let some things get a little crazy. Because Israel could have realized they knew the promises of God. They realized what they were going for all those years. They could have realized and said, you know what? We don't need to be here anymore. God, get us out of your help. Because it says the moment they started praying to God and saying, God, get us out, God responded and sent Moses. So what would have happened if 30 years beforehand, they would have said, God, you know, we're tired of being here. We don't want to settle. We've got, to, we've got promises on the other side. We've got to get out of Egypt to see your word fulfilled. We've got to get out of Egypt to see what you want to do. I'm here to tell you today, there is a harvest coming. Revival in the church is already happening. I believe there's a harvest coming if it's not already here. But we will not see that harvest and reap those promises if we are satisfied with staying inside of Egypt. That's why this matters. That's why it matters. Because we get so comfortable. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. But we get so comfortable with, with what the world has to offer and what it looks like now and how I'm feeling now when the world convinces you this is good enough, just stay here. The adversary doesn't want you to go all in for Jesus. The adversary doesn't want you to lay it all aside and say, God, here, take everything that I am. Because he knows if you do that, he, his kingdom is a threat. That's the same, re same thing with Pharaoh. Pharaoh realizes, oh, i got to do something about Israelites. If I let them linger here too long, they may realize how powerful they are, and they're going to change plans, and they're going to impact my kingdom. And the adversary's got the same plan with the same, with the same thoughts and the same, the same uh, approach with the world. I'm going to use the world to, to get them to stay comfortable and to get them to be satisfied with the things of their life and the, the afflictions that they live with. How many people in here... I'm not actually asking you to respond, but I'm, it's a hypothetical. How many people in here, you may be surprised. And how many people in here are currently living with affliction in your life? That God is not calling you to live with anymore, but you've gotten so comfortable with it, you stopped asking him to do something about it. There are people in here with physical issues and ailments in your body that have become such a normalcy in your life, you don't know what it's like to live without them. You don't know what it's like. To, so you're just like, yeah, it's fine. I've just gone this off. When God says... You, I'll take it if you want me to have it. You don't have to stay there anymore. There are people with challenges in their minds and in their hearts that God wants to free you from, but because the world says it's normal to have this problem and to deal with this situation, so just stay here and we'll give you some medication or you can go talk to someone about it. When God says, I can free you from that. I can say, there are marriages in this room that you are struggling. You're married. You, don't, you may have a good facade and have it all together on the outside, but there are marriages in this room that are struggling and you've got problems and you've gotten so used to living in that conflict you've forgotten what it was like before all the problems and before all the bickering and before all the disagreements. I'm not talking from a young minister man of experience of two years of marriage. I'm talking because the God, from God is telling me some stuff right now. And the Spirit is ministering. There are people, you're married, you've gotten so used to what it's like now and, and the way things are now when God says if you would just come to me with your brokenness if you would just come if you would just cry out like Israel if you would just cry out and say say God I don't want this anymore this isn't my main point here but I'm here right now and I'm going to stay here but there what, what affliction is in your life that you are allowing to remain because you've gotten so just it's it's just God I've asked you to deal with this before I've asked you to talk, but but it was, but you still you never got rid of it. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hold on to it a little longer. And maybe he didn't get rid of it at that time because it was meant to stay there for that moment. It was meant to be there for that moment. But God says, Hey, I, I'm done. I needed it for up to this point. You're now five years beyond. There are people who are worried about their children. God says, I can take care of that. People worried about financial issues. I I can take care of it. But you've got to come to me. The world says financial trouble is the normalcy. Everyone's in debt. Everyone's got problems. God, I've called you to be set apart from them. You don't have to deal with it the same way the world does. You don't have to go through it the same My mom is a miracle after miracle after miracle. When I say the things that God did through her life and in her life that I was able to see, there was times we couldn't eat. We didn't have food. And uh, <clears throat> it was amazing. There was, there was two times in particular one time we came to church, we hadn't eaten, there wasn't food in the fridge, 
she was having, I think it was like a furlough or something was happening, and it was, she was struggling with work. It was, yeah, it was during a really bad furlough and all this other whatever. But anyway, um, and we come to church, and she wasn't telling people about it. She wasn't, she wasn't talking about it, but we were, we were struggling. And she comes to church, and she has her Bible with her, and we go. And then we go to leave after service, and she grabs her Bible, and like a $100 bill just falls out of it. Didn't know where it came from. Still doesn't today. This, is, this one's a really cool one. We come home. Still, she's still, we still have no idea where it came from. We come home after a service, and uh, she heard a knock at the back door when we came in the house. And so she goes, I said, yeah, it was the porch. And she goes, and the porch door is propped open, and there's a bunch of groceries right there. Doesn't know where it came from. Because she didn't decide, you know what, I'm just going to go just live in this problem and just stick with it here and figure it out on my own. But I'm going to take it to God because I don't need to deal with this by myself. He said, this isn't my point here today, but I'm talking about it. So what is it in your life that maybe there are some afflictions that God says, I'm, I'm, I'm not calling you to stay there anymore. I've got a plan on the other side, but you've got to get so uncomfortable with being comfortable where you are. You've got to decide, I don't want to live day to day with this problem. I don't want to live day to day with this addiction. I don't want to live day to day in these chains and in these shackles and in these situations. Because you know what's interesting? If you don't make peace with those chains and with those shackles and with those situations, you may be even free from them. But if you don't let God take them and deal with them and you move forward, you could abort the promises in the future. Because there's a, we can all stand. There's a, a, a later in the scripture when the point comes and Israel is about to go into the promised land and they go to, to look it all up and see what's going on. In fact, uh, <clears throat> sorry, now it's going to take me so long to find it. I know it's in there. Um, uh, Actually, you know what? Maybe my phone. I know it's there, but I feel like people are doubting me. So it's like, let me just let me just give them the verse. <clears throat> um, but there's a verse that talks about uh, when the, when uh, Israel is going. Oh yeah, no, it is in there. Stay with me. When Israel is going into uh, the promised land. They're trying to go into the promised land. They're trying to finally, you know, become who God's called them to be and do what he's called them to do. And they're, they're there. They send some spies to go scout it out. Yo, all, you all know the story. Some men said, yeah, we can take it. The majority of them said, no, we can't. The verse is Numbers 13.33. It says, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight and we all know the story they saw themselves grasshoppers all the nations were like no we were afraid of you and all this other stuff and they wasted so much time because they how they viewed themselves but what's amazing is when you see the descendants of Anak that's what they saw and that's what made them afraid that word Anak that name literally means neck I know that's super profound but if you look at the root word for neck, it's actually necklace, as in to choke. In other words, a chain and a shackle. So when Israel's looking at these giants, they're not just seeing some future opposition, but they're seeing a reflection of what they had already dealt with and gone through. And they got so afraid because this is like, oh, this looks like what we just came out of. I don't know if I can go back into that bondage. And I, so you may finally find yourself at a point when you become free and God sets you free from that bondage, but then you've got to deal with it in your mind and say, God, I've got to actually let that go and give it to you because if I let that define how I move forward, I could very much so abort something that you're trying to do in my life. So I've got to make up my mind and decide, God, you know what? I want it no matter what. I've got to decide for myself, God, I'm not staying enchanted by the lies of this world. I'm not going to be convinced they can give me something that you can't. I'm not going to be enchanted by the lies of this world and, and submit myself to things in opposition that I don't need to. You've called me beyond that. You've called me to be greater than that. You've called me to do more than that. But I've got to make up my mind. The same way Israel had to finally say, you know what, God, we don't want to stay here anymore. Each and every one of us in our own lives have to decide, God, I don't want to stay where I'm at anymore. There's more out there. 
there's a deeper side, a deeper water for me to go into, a, a deeper place in God for me to get to, a deeper calling in God, a deeper relationship to have in you. But it's going to require me to not be comfortable and complacent with where I'm at anymore. All across this place, can we lift up our hands? In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, right now, Father. Right now, God. There is nothing greater than the call of God on my life. There is nothing greater than answering your call for me, God. But Father, I'm going to be honest. There are times in this life when things get hard, when things get challenging, when situations, it's easier, God, to just be fine settling with where I'm at. But I know that your call has a plan and a purpose to take me beyond where I'm at. But in order for me to get where you were trying to take me, it requires another level of consecration. It requires another level of dedication. It requires another level of sacrifice. It requires me not being willing to grow complacent with where I'm at and, and allow the world to determine who I am and what I do and where I go. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> In the name of just come on, I'm talking to some people here tonight that know that God's got a call. You know you have a place in His purpose and in His kingdom, and you're involved in it. But you also know that there are things and areas in your life that you have allowed yourself to become apathetic and complacent and say, you know what, I'm okay right here. I I I'm going to get involved in the kingdom of God. I don't want you to touch this part. Or I'm going to get involved in your word, God, but I can't let this thing go. When God said, I've called you to be set apart. I've called you to be different. I've called you to be different from the world. I've called you to be separate from the world. Not live in it. Not join them in their bondage, but help free them from it. Egypt won't know what God is and who God is until you're walking in the way you're supposed to walk and behaving the way you're supposed to behave. And if we're walking one with the world, then how will they know who He is? In the name of Jesus. I open up this altar if anyone wants to come and find a place of prayer. Just a place for you and him to talk. You know what it is in your life. You know the areas of your life. Maybe there's something you need to let go over. Maybe it's just a, a commitment and a dedication. God, I don't want anything to get in the way of your call for my life. I don't want anything to get in the way of who you've called me to be, God. There might not be something I'm challenged with today, I'm battling today, but there may come a point, God, when something, when something appears, when something shows up, and I don't want to get, get comfortable and, and make it a normal for me to stay there, God. But I want to go beyond that. I want to press beyond that. I want to push past that, and I want to answer your call. I'm going to let go when you say let go. I'm going to grab a hold when you say grab a hold. Ilamande abahasha tolo mondo boku sataye nisha remande alalamando lo bo sate alalamasaya yere mendi alalamaye nisha molo boko suta lamande ashaye ilamando lo bo kasani alalabahataya yere mendi alalamando seki alalamasaye. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus,
Come on, be sensitive right now. If you don't need prayer, if you're not praying, don't get, get, don't get disconnected, please. Sing this song. It is a time of worship. Or just close your eyes or find someone to pray with. God is doing some things in some people's lives right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, God. Help us not to be enchanted, God, with the things of this world, Father. That would try to deceive, God. That would try to hinder, God. That would try to distract from your calling, God. In the name of Jesus. Help me to consecrate How myself to the call, God. To lay aside every distraction, God. Lay aside everything, God, that would that would keep me, God, enchanted with the things of this world. That would keep me content, God, with the things of this world, God, that would seek to kill, that would seek to destroy, that would seek to silence my voice for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I lose the liberation. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, God, to set free every mind that is captive, to set free every body that is addicted, God, to set free every person, God, that has any spirit attached to them, God, of this world that would try to see them, God, not be answered to the call, God, not become called I it to be. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Show yourself. Say my Satan. That's more than emotion. Shimon the Lobo ma rema shenda. Sito the Mondo Lobo Saye. How by this truth. Nisha rema de la leve caso no Lobo Saye. Nisha rema de la lama Saye. Seta, Isi Catalamando Bosha, this truth in 
in the name of Jesus. 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 I lose the true love of God to reach down into every home, every family. In the name of Jesus Christ, every attempt of the adversary to divide a household, to break apart a family. Lord, I lose your love in the name of Jesus. Not the deceptive love of this world, not the deceptive lust of this world, not the attempts of the adversary to divide a family, to divide a home, a part of your body, God. So let your love set. Let your love mend. Let your love make whole and renew and restore. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I bind every cheap enchantment and every cheap attempt to, to thwart God, to mimic your hope, to mimic your joy, to mimic your freedom. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I lose a true liberation by your spirit. I lose the freedom of who you are, God, to be released. Your word says that where your spirit is, there is liberty. And I lose your spirit, God, over every home, over every mind, over every life. In the name of Jesus. Let the cries of Israel come forth. Let us not grow weary. Let us not be silent in affliction that he has not called you to live in. Don't remain silent in affliction that he has not called you to stay consecrated to. Come out of that world. Come out of that affliction. Grow tired of that bondage and speak and let your voice be heard. Let your cries find themselves in the throne room with God. words could ever say. I promise, Lord, I'll never walk away. I'll never walk away. Isha, ela mande la makatobosa. Shita ramande ya masatobosa. And all the things that draw me close to you. Give me a love strong and I will not be afraid. Shema, shema, shata, shaka, samando bosu talaye. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So I promise you, I'll never walk away. I'll never walk away. I'll never walk away. I'll never walk away. Nila mande erere anda seka ya shoromo le ala mande ala la masata ye ere amande ala la mando lo mokusa ya e ala la 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 mande ala la masata ye ila mande ala la mando robo kisa na ala la maye. in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus this world has nothing to offer me <laughs> It is more has nothing but cheap imitation of what God has in store. Their love is not like God's love. This world's hope is not like God's hope. This world's satisfaction is not like the satisfaction that comes from the things of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Isha Rema Eka Yesho Romondo Busutaye. How by this sweet sound, I 
ni la manda e ni la manda e redente ya bakasata ni romondo ye ni la mamande sabate shadaya shata era la mande a la mano usata shade le bende si ni la mandi a ramamasikaya ne le ando romobo suta ne share marienda e la ramakasaya ne la 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 mande a la la mando romo no ye a samaye e le a la 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 mando lo 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 bo sata ya la 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 masaye e la la mare maesha Shibo romo le arama e sata ishandere alalamando robo kusaye ni alama e la ma e rama e ya e sha shomo ni ria na ele a sata e ni ria mando robo sinda e sha ni alama ni alama hata e ne la mando romondo e si da la mai e cala mande alla la mando satai 